Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Kunal Sharma. I am one of the founders and directors of Mexis Education. Mexis uh, is an education innovations company. Uh, we have presence in about uh, 3,000 schools. We've covered about 5 lakh students through the different product service lines that we have. And basically, uh, this presentation, uh, because the topic itself today covers uh, how should localized learning be in a global context, what I would like to uh, throw light on shortly and uh, probably with a little speed is what really is the global context that we're talking about right now. Uh, <clears throat> for the last couple of years, uh, we have felt that we are living a global revolution. I remember from in 2000, when I was still in my college, that was the IIT, there was a time that people uh, could work pretty much without a computer or a laptop. By 2004, when we passed out, a computer or a laptop without an internet was considered to be a dysfunctional device. In those four years, there was such a transmogrification in, in the technology, in the connectivity, that people could had stopped imagining their life or their workspaces without the computer or the internet being there. Uh, now, how does this uh, revolution affect uh, educationists? This is one of the questions that I've asked educationists very often. What is Moodle? How many of you have a Facebook or Kut or a Twitter account or a LinkedIn account? Do you really know what a wiki is? How do you start a YouTube channel? Surprisingly, most of us as educationists do not know the answer to these questions. But the fact is, most of the school or the college goers today do. They do know the answer to these questions. The question is, if we don't, who are we teaching and what are we teaching them for? Now, there are three key points that I want to throw light upon. The first is that the structure of knowledge consumption is changing in the world. From a time where there was no aid available and in a classroom I could cover 50 students to a time where now there is a mic, I can possibly cover uh, 1,000 students. There, we are currently living in a time where through web and satellite streaming, the possibility of how many students can be covered has become limitless. A couple of examples in this domain have been Khan Academy, there's uh, an ICANN channel on YouTube, and there is wikipedia.org, which was considered an audacious attempt. People laughed when Wikipedia came. They said that nobody can compete with, the, with Britannica Encyclopedia. But within six or eight years, uh, Wikipedia proved to be a more accurate uh, source of information than the Britannica Encyclopedia. The second context is that information has exploded. It is impossible to keep pace with the amount of information that is being generated in the world today. Now, what, what really uh, becomes a point that needs focus is that in this world, it is not important that we feed students with too much information because they will not be able to remember it. The important thing is because there are a lot of content providers. What we take pride in at ICANN and Mexis is that we understand the difference between content and context. Unless content rides on context, it does not become knowledge or it cannot be transferred to knowledge. The third context is that uh, there has been a paradigm shift for people from becoming uh, consumers of content to becoming co-producers and co-authors of content. One of the ideal examples of this, again, is Wikipedia. I'm reasonably sure most of you would have heard about uh, this website called Moodle. There is uh, How Stuff Works. There is this uh, website that you must uh, go and check out. It's called Triple PST, Pete's PowerPoint Station. It has over 15,000 uh, PowerPoint uh, presentations for teachers across the curriculum. So what is happening in the world is that the teachers, rather than saying that, okay, you know, we will consume content that the publishers are dishing out to us, we will become the co-authors or the co-producers of content. So that has been another uh, paradigm shift. Now, in the wake of these three changes, the important thing is what we as educationists must, must do. And I would just like to, you know, mention a couple of things that we've tried to uh, endeavor through ICANN, which is one of our band, brands to uh, offer turnkey solutions to school. The one small but extremely important thing that needs to be done is to get the internet into the classroom. The internet is a tremendous source of information, but I do not think today the definition of ICT as it exists today really has focus of getting moderated internet. It's not the entire internet. It is internet where you've already bookmarked sites which have relevant information to the chapter that you're teaching in the classroom that day. So can you connect a web browser or a bookmarking tool to the ICT setup in the classroom? 
can you have a knowledge cafe for teachers where they can go and they can browse and they can tag information from a YouTube or a Khan Academy or an Icon uh, YouTube channel and bring it into the classroom? The third thing is, can you take the classroom to the students' homes? Currently, the technology that exists allows us to do that. The question is, are we endeavoring to do that? So one of the things that we've done is, uh, through Icon.in, the teacher has a portal through which they can give homeworks to students. They can take opinion polls from parents and from students. So this makes the entire system a truly 360-degree system. The second is, uh, what do we do in the wake of the fact that information has uh, exploded? Like I said, uh, as adults, we feel that it is the birth or it is the fundamental responsibility of a student to study or to learn. Sadly, unfortunately, students feel otherwise. They don't think that they need to learn. So unless you make content dramatized, unless you add engagement and context to the content, unless you have a, an element of fun and engagement in the content, you cannot dish out uh, any kind of content to students, whether it is 2D or 3D or 4D, because there's a lot of talk about 3D content, 2D content. But the fact is, unless it's enjoyable, it doesn't matter. Today, there are too many channels which are coming on Cartoon Network which are 2D. But students are, are consuming that content. So it's not really a question of 2D, 3D. It's really a question of content engagement. The second is, are we creating a platform for students to be able to compete in a healthy and spirited way? Are we creating an incentive for teachers to really come forward and develop digital resources, which is a couple of which are a couple of things that we are, we take care uh, through our competition called Scientifica, and also CoCreate, which is a nationwide platform for teachers to come forward and to create digital resources. The last is uh, how does ICT or how how do how how uh, in the localized learning context do we make teachers the co-producers or the co-authors of content. For, for a very long time now, the definition of ICT has been a computer, a projector, and a lot of content loaded on it. Fact is, teachers do not want to use content that is being given to them by anybody else. They want to use content that they themselves have, have created. As a teacher, if I've made my own PPT, I would prefer that PPT over a 3D content that has been dished by probably some other content provider. The fact is, do we allow teachers to create this content and to archive it in a structured format so that they can use it in the classroom. Fact is, most of the uh, classroom solutions which are being offered by different kinds of providers do not allow that. So there needs to be a learning management system which allows uh, teachers to create and author content and to archive it in a format such that they can bring it back into the classroom. There's a very small and a very uh, simple time cost analysis which gives you the advantage of a learning management system. In the assumption that there are 30 teachers in a certain school and the teaching time per day per teacher is four hours, the percentage of board writing time, the time that they write on the board, if it is 20%, the total board writing time per day goes to 0.8 hours. The total board writing time per year goes to 200 hours. If you look at the average salary of the teacher, which is 12,000, what you will realize that the school spends about 8,64,000 rupees for the teacher just to keep on writing the same stuff again and again on the blackboard. So a simple solution like a PowerPoint presentation, which allows you to give a step-by-step -step of numericals, is something that can save that kind of time for the school, if archived in a manner that uh, you know they can get it back into the classroom. Uh, right towards the end, a couple of more points, uh, which I will probably not elaborate on because of the paucity of time. There is an urgent need that testing is looked at as a way of learning rather than a way of judgment. It does not make sense that at the end of the year, I judge a student and say that, look, you've got 60% because the student is not going to do anything about it. It's not as if they're going to repeat their class just because they've got a 60% in a science or a maths. So it's important that testing becomes a within the classroom exercise, and that is only possible through real-time assessment. So if I have a classroom, if I've taken a half an hour session, I give five minutes to testing, students can uh, use an I can assess kind of a device, and they can give their uh, responses to objective questions. There's a real-time analysis of those, uh, of those responses, which allows the teacher to know what are the classes or what are the areas in which students have really not understood a topic and lay some impetus on that. The second is in this world, Teachers need to become educational entrepreneurs. 
they can no longer remain teachers. They have to become managers, they have to become CEOs, and they have to become people who can create their own content and think about how to earn money out of that content. Why doesn't school think of itself as a research center? There is no place in the world where there is more knowledge than what is available in the school. We as an organization are 1,000 people plus. We have 400 people who are creating content, but we still do not believe that we can surpass the kind of knowledge that maybe 10 schools combined can bring on the table. So teachers need to start taking up that role. And the third is like any organization, there needs to be an audit for the school as an institution. Every organization has an audit. Why hasn't the best practice of audit for an academic process, for the administrative process, moved to any kind of an educational institution? Uh, with these things, uh, the, the summarizing point is that I think that there's a lot of cynicism or feigned ignorance which I don't think will get us anywhere as educationists. Like I said, we are living a revolution. Changes are imminent, whether we like to believe it or not. And today, as it stands, education can no longer be looked as a job. It has to be looked as a career, and a thriving career is that. Thank you, thank you very much.